Welcome to the DigiGods Podcast, Wade Major, along with... I'm here. I'm here for one more week, Tim Cockshell. And uh, Mark will be back next week, and we'll give us all the details of his uh, wonderful, wonderful vacation and uh, what it was like to be in France when everything went down in Nice. Um, yeah, the uh, it's shaping up to be an interesting summer. Uh, is, is Feature-wise, I find the failure of a lot of live-action films, notably Tarzan and... Uh, yeah, Ghostbusters. Oh, well, Go- Ghostbusters did okay, it's actually. It's okay, but uh, not great. But, but it, but it was, there may it, not be didn't another one. Didn't open number one. Didn't open number one. There may not be another one. It's not going to go up. It's not going to go up next week. And uh, the X-Men film didn't do so great. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Batman and Superman. It's like it's really shaping up to be... Uh, it's the animated films that are just killing it this year. It's, no, it's Utopia and uh, and, um, uh, Dory. Finding Dory, uh, uh, most money of any animated film. That Crazy. blows me away, dude. That the, the original film, Ice sixteen Age? years Ice Age comes yeah. out. Yeah. Sixteen years ago, that original film, and Finding Dory makes four hundred and sixty some odd million dollars over, over the course of two weeks or uh, three weeks in release. Yeah, my daughter's nuts for Dory. It is. It's just a. It's Those just, are all the better films. Zootopia, best film I've seen this year. Oh, absolutely. Year. Zootopia is amazing. Zootopia is a fantastic film. Yeah, I, it's, it's a weird year that way. It'll be interesting to see how things wrap up at the end. Uh, anyway, you know what? Let's, let's jump right in. We've got some, uh, some docs to talk about, and we're, and we're going to have... Um, you know what? Actually, here's what I'm going to do right at the top of the show. Um, we, we've got, a, we've got a, uh, an interview that's going to go along with some stuff that we're going to be talking about later on in the show. Uh, but we've got a, uh, a cool little giveaway that I want to offer to our uh, listeners. We have uh, five of these to give away. These are newer tech lightning cables. They are uh, half a meter long, each of them. And uh, if you've got an iPhone, if you've got anything that you need an, an Apple lightning cable for, uh, go ahead and email us at gods at digigods.com just send us an email at gods at digigods.com and uh, five lucky people who put the word lightning in the uh, in the title in the subject line will uh, be chosen at random to receive a half meter long very cool lightning cable you're going to get whatever color you get we only have five different colors we got green, red, <laughs> blue, white and black uh, so if you don't mind just getting one of those colors at random, then go ahead and, uh, and email us, gods at digigods.com, lightning in the subject line. We got these from Newer Tech. Newer Tech provides a lot of really fun stuff to us, and uh, you know, every time a holiday of some kind rolls around, we get the, these great offers from cool things from Newer Tech. And uh, they just make a lot of really fun stuff just for your, uh, your home electronic uh, hub uh, connecting all of your stuff. Uh, there's, all, there's always interesting things, little keyboards and keypads and uh, all kinds of fun electronic gizmos. Newer Tech's a really great company. So they were kind enough to furnish us some uh, lightning cables to send to uh, some of our listeners. So half meter long uh, lightning cables, high quality. They got that woven outer, uh, outer uh, skin on them so they don't crack and they don't break and these things will last forever. So send us uh, lightning in the subject line to gods at digigods.com and somebody you're, you're going to get either green, red, blue, white, or black. That's what you're going to get. Um, all right, Tim, let's, uh, we're going to have an interview later on in the show as well. Mm. Who are we talking to? And uh, we're, well, uh, you'll find out. Yeah, well, you'll we'll find out. It relates, yeah. it relates to one of the films that we're talking about. And if uh, people who frequent the Facebook page will probably know. They're probably already ahead of us. So uh, on the doc front, uh, this is maybe my favorite documentary of last year. Uh, it floored me. I, was, I thought it was amazing and uh, absolutely dazzling. The Russian Woodpecker. This is my, uh, the filmmaker is Chad Gracia. Uh, or Gracia, but the the story is mind blowing. It centers on uh, Fedor Alexandrovich, who is a really eccentric uh, Ukrainian artist. And here's his story: He was born um, uh, around the time of Chernobyl, and he had uh, developmental disabilities because of his mother being irradiated from Chernobyl uh, residually uh, during her pregnancy, and he becomes obsessed and he's a very interesting artist and he's very obsessive and weird and eccentric but he becomes obsessed 
with unraveling the mystery of Chernobyl. And all of this is against the backdrop of the recent turmoil in Ukraine where, you know, Russia was, was you know, they seized uh, the Crimea and then they were, you know, fomenting rebellion on the border with Russia after that whole, you know, governmental uh, turnaround, change of president, throwing the old guy out, putting the new guy in, all that stuff. And this becomes a an extraordinary mystery because there's this giant antenna array near Chernobyl that is allegedly different from Chernobyl uh, that exists for no reason. And it used to, the reason they call this is called the Russian woodpecker is that for a long time, this thing was sending this woodpecker sounding noise mm. over the North Pole on and, and pounding North America with this woodpeckery sound, this giant radar array. And people are thinking, okay, is this some kind of cyber attack? This like a radio attack? What is this? And it's this weird mystery that that centers around what you know Russian politics and his birth and Chernobyl and modern politics and the way that this all devolves. At a certain point, you think this is the craziest conspiracy theory I've ever heard, and by the end of this thing, you think, son of a bitch, he's right. Mm. He, to- he figured it out. It's like a, it's like a giant detective thing. It's rather extraordinary. Uh, it's one of the most amazing docs I have seen in years, and uh, I thought it was the best documentary of last year. Did not get an Oscar nomination. The other Ukrainian uh, doc, the much more conventional one, did. But this is uh, this is superb, and uh, it was a big hit at Sundance. And uh, it's called the Russian Woodpecker, and it does, it absolutely has to be seen to be believed. It's amazing. Uh, I've got a documentary here called The Fear of Thirteen. Um, I did see this one as well, spellbinding uh, film. Um, just after this, this, a guy's been on death row for 23 years. This guy's been on death row for 23 years. Uh, these filmmakers go in and sit down with him, and he, and they, and he tells them his story. Uh, he's just telling the actual factual story. There's a disclaimer at the top of this film uh, where the filmmakers tell us that everything that this guy is about to tell us in this film, they have already gone oh, wow. and verified as factually true. So, so what, they're, what they're saying to you is, as you begin to watch this film, do not concern yourself with whether or not anything that you hear this guy say uh, is true or not. We've already looked, mm. we've verified it all. Know that everything that he says is true, and the reason why we have to tell you this, because you're not going to believe a goddamn word of this, because <laughs> it sounds insane, but it's all true, we promise you. This guy, um, interesting thing, uh, sentenced to death for rape and murder, a uh, whole complicated story. At one point, he requested that his, that his uh, um, um, sentence be expedited. Uh, not only was his sentence not expedited, uh, his he was he, he he slipped the noose completely. And why and how and and all of that, you just gotta sit down and watch the movies. Despite the disclaimer and everything, you're still not gonna believe a word of it. That's amazing. But it's all true. The fear of thirteen. And then we have a uh, an activism doc here called Rising Tides from Cinema Libre. And uh, this is a effectively kind of a, uh, it's not a climate change doc per se, it's more about coastal erosion combined with the rise of sea levels uh, because of uh, climate change. Um, regardless of where you stand on the, the political divide of that, um, the issue of coastal erosion is a pretty legit one and uh, is, is really interesting. And there's, some, you know, there's certainly some stuff in here that people can you know, argue about and debate about and the, the, whether or not it's being properly presented. But um, it's a pretty compelling doc, and uh, Cinema Libre always releases fairly compelling stuff. Um, it very well shot, very well put together. A lot of uh, you know it, it's important data here. They kind of you get bombarded at times with it. A lot of a lot of science and stuff from you know no, people with nonprofits and you know experts and, uh, and engineers and whatnot. So you, you, you do kind of get hit with a lot of information, but um, it's worth watching. It's definitely worth watching. Worth uh, worth being aware of certainly the uh, the fact that you know. A lot of these details exist. So that is called Rising Tides. I uh, got a little documentary here. Uh, it's more or less a biopic, Yulom's Cure. It's, it's, a, it's a film about a guy named, a guy named Irvin D. Yulom. Uh, he's a psychotherapist, a fairly old fellow who's been working as a psychotherapist for many years, uh, has written some absolutely extraordinary books. And this is, in fact, a, a biopic about him, but it's really about what he's come to understand about the human mind. This Now, we, we get into a whole lot of stuff here that has to do with his life and his philosophy and some of the things that he lived through, but what he's really talking about here 
is neuroscience. Mm. And it's quite fascinating. You know, you know uh, people know people, I think it was a, uh, who was it, Dr. Oliver, um, I forget what, it was, what his name is, uh, he died not too terribly long ago. Um, and, and a few very important neuroscience scientists. Neuroscience is making leaps and bounds, what, what we're coming to know about the way the mind works. And this guy has really put some of it together. This is only 74 minutes uh, long, uh, and uh, mostly it's in Hebrew. Uh, and with English subtitles, Yalom's Cure. Very nice. Uh, here's one from PBS. Saudi Arabia uncovered a, a this is a frontline doc. They call it a rare, revealing look inside the Saudi kingdom. Um, it, it is certainly compelling, that is for sure. And uh, I mean, for my, as far as I'm concerned, it's 60 minutes. It is not nearly long enough. Uh, you need like three hours to really, really get into this. Um, I actually know a, a, a shocking amount for a film critic about the history of Saudi Arabia. Kind of an obsession of mine. It goes with being an obsessive about Lawrence of Arabia. You become obsessed with the movie, then the movie leads you to yeah. an obsession about the subject matter of the movie in any case. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, this is, this is a lot of, I mean, you, you, we don't think of Saudi Arabia as being a country like North Korea where we have to smuggle footage in and smuggle it out. I mean, I know people who've worked in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. You know, we can go, we can fly in, we can fly out. I was stationed in Saudi Arabia in 1981, I think. So, yeah. you yeah. know, we, we, we don't think of them as being like North Korea. But once you're there, it is. Yeah. It, is a, it is an incredibly closed and repressive and psychotic place. It is and, the kingdom of Saud. Oh, and the, you know, if you don't understand that Saudi is about the family yeah. that runs it, uh, a, a family that is, has run it for you know the better part of that peninsula for over 300 years and uh, essentially the entire peninsula since they uh, conquered the rest of it in the uh, about 1924. Um, in any case, this is a, a chilling look at, uh, at the efforts of activists in Saudi Arabia to try to change it. It is uh, it's a fascinating thing to look at because I just was on Film Week recently as you were, but uh, talking about a movie. Um, about a Chinese activist who faces many of the same things. And, yeah. You know, at a certain point, it just dawns on you, most of the world, we're kind of spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> you know, most of the world is not, most of the world is not the countries that get to buy their Blu-rays and their DVDs and complain that it's, it's region-coded. Most of them don't get anything that they want and they have to smuggle th their food in and out. And it's, you know, we don't live in a friendly, friendly planet. Yeah, we're a little part. delusional here in the yeah. West about the nature of government and, and what that word even means. It's very true. So Saudi Arabia Uncovered is a, is a hell of a frontline doc. Needed to be longer, though. And then uh, King George uh, is uh, from MPI. Uh, this is not about King George. This is about a... Um, the owner of a restaurant named Georges Perrier, who uh, is known as King George, and um, the, effectively, this is a, um, a I don't know, it, it, there's a bit, there's a drama that goes on here with King George and his restaurant, and he's a, you know, he's a very famous guy, and it's a very famous restaurant, and uh, it's set, it's in Philadelphia for those, you know, it's not actually in France, it's a Philadelphia restaurant. And uh, our good friend Robert Abley uh, from Lafka is uh, quoted on the back of the box, which is nice. Um, I agree with what Robert says about it. Poignant, poignant funny, and well-seasoned portrait of autumnal fervor. That's very Bob. Uh, it just doesn't have a pun in it. But it, um, this is shot over the course of three years. And it gets into the. It's much more interesting than any of those restaurant shows where you know you're sort of uh, wondering whether or not they'll keep the restaurant open and everything's all done reality show style. Uh, reality show style. This is um, this is a really interesting process, and um, it's worth checking out, especially if you've ever watched Top Chef. Uh, Nicholas Elmy, who's on Top Chef, he's in this as well, and uh, it gives you an insight into the culinary world and restaurants and the ins and outs of it that you will not soon forget. I will leave you with that. Uh, Rabin's last day in uh, November of 1995, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. Yeah, uh, at that. the end of a political rally, killed by a deeply observant Jew. Um, it, it has been said that with that assassination, all hope uh, for resolving uh, you know, the Palestinian-Israeli problem uh, was lost, and certainly it was it was certainly lost for the last twenty plus years. That that's a fact. 
Uh, this film, this documentary, is about uh, the last two or three days in Rabin's life, and it goes over uh, who it was that assassinated him, a young, a very observant Jewish man, and how that assassination more or less destroyed the Israeli left and brought to power the hawks it did. that are still in power to this day, yeah. including Benny Netanyahu and a few, and, and, and a few others. So, uh, a very, you know, every now and again we run across some really interesting films uh, that, that speak to the sort of history of the Israeli-Palestinian. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so this is a very interest, interesting one, a pivotal moment in the history of that, that period. And uh, then the last doc here. Oh, I think you got one more. I got one, one more. You, you yeah, got yeah. one more. So our second to last. Uh, this is Strange and Familiar, Architecture on Fogo Island. This is from First Run Features. Uh, really interesting. Uh, documentary docs always compel me. I, I find them just fascinating. Because, or architecture docs, I should say. Architecture docs always really uh, I find fascinating. Uh, this is about an hour long, and it's uh, all about Fogo Island, which is this little tiny island up on, in, off of Canada's uh, Newfoundland coast. And um, the, the, the economy of this island is very, very fragile. So, you know, fishing is drying up and, or there's a bad season or whatever it is. So uh, this architect uh, named Todd Saunders gets to work with a, uh, an investor named Zeta Cobb. And they are going to try to build uh, a very unique sort of uh, hotel on the uh, coastline of Fogo Island. Um, that has extraordinary kind of vision and then winds up having these even more extraordinary uh, impacts afterwards in terms of sustainability and, uh, you know, environmental um, uh, integration and all. It, it's really, it's, it's quite fascinating. So, you know, it's uh, the, the whole process of architecture, not just in terms of design, but in terms of how architecture becomes a tool of addressing social change and, and uh, economic and uh, environmental change. It's all really a fascinating process. So anyway, uh, Marsha Connolly and Catherine Knight are the directors. Strange and Familiar, Architecture on Fogo Island. Uh, and I have a black jacket here, an interesting doc, uh, particularly apropos given some of the circumstances that we're in today. Uh, this is about a young former Black Panther uh, who leads a 16-week week gang intervention course in South Central Los Angeles, right? Involves the city council and the police department. Just today, uh, I, I believe the game, big, big hip-hop guy, the game, and a couple of weeks ago, Snoop Dogg, too, uh, had another one of these uh, sort of intervention things where these these folks came together with the police department and community members to talk and figure these things out. This guy's been doing this for a number of years now. It's a it's a 16-week course, course. He walks through the history of the community, the history of the people in the community, the history of the people juxtaposed to the, to the police in the community. Outstanding. And, 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 and everybody just saw the work. This is a very powerful documentary. This is one of those kind of docs where you have these people from opposite sides of everything in the room, uh, and they all, in fact, do get to screaming and yelling at each other. Uh, but but he will not let these people out of this room, and he's a big brother, so he will not let these people out of this room until they've screamed it all out, and they can walk out of that room feeling better about each other and themselves than they did when they walked in. That might be one of the ways to get at some of this business, you know, just get it out, get it out of your system, get it said, uh, and then and then let it go. Anyway, it's it's a pretty powerful documentary, particularly in the context of some things today. The Black Jacket, directed by a fellow named. Uh, Ryan Simon. Ryan Simon. Fascinating. All right, and uh, I've got some foreign films here, and then we're going to get into classic films and uh, our interview this week. Uh, we got a lot of stuff from Cohen, and this is one of the more eccentric ones that Cohen has picked up lately. Full disclosure, uh, Tim and I have done uh, commentary work for Cohen, oh, and yeah. um, I actually did a couple of them recently. Uh, Rams is this this really crazy, freaky Icelandic movie about a couple of sheep herding brothers who've been estranged for decades who are sort of forced back together when there's this disease outbreak among the sheep and the rams. Uh, it's called Rams, appropriately, and it is every bit as cool and weird and eccentric as you expect of Icelandic movies. If you have any familiarity with Icelandic movies, they are unlike anything else. They are really, really unhinged. And uh, great stuff. So uh, definitely check out that. Out. That's on Blu-ray. And then a French thriller here with Gilles Lelouch, who is one of my new favorite actors. He's been around a little while, but I, he, if, you, if you saw him uh, uh, in uh, the, uh, the Connection, which was my 
Oh, that, that was so good. That was amazing. It was my favorite film of, uh, was it last year? I guess it was my favorite yeah, film of yeah. last year. It was earlier last year. My favorite film of last year, uh, which he's in with Jean Dujardin. He plays the bad guy, this uh, this drug dealing uh, guy in the 1970s, late 70s in France. Anyway, Gilles Lelouch, great <laughs> actor. Here he plays, uh, he basically plays a guy who exposes banking fraud in uh, and winds up on the wrong side of the wrong people. Um, it's a good thriller. French thrillers are a lot more intelligent than American thrillers. A lot fewer guns and more cerebral kind of engaging of the uh, of the problem. Anyway, that's really good. That's on DVD. And then um, the, a couple here from Maurice Piala, who uh, whose collection they have been steadily releasing at Cohen as well. We have volume two and volume three from the Maurice Piala collection, the films of Maurice Piala. Uh, volume two is the first of two films that we're going to be talking about today that actually won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. The other one, which Tim's got over there, which is one of my favorite films ever made. Uh, Best Intentions to Billy August? Best, it yeah. was just amazing. Anyway, the first one here is the Maurice Piala film Under the Son of Satan, uh, which uh, was incredibly controversial because Piala went up, and he died soon after, he went up to the podium, and uh, in accepting his award, he says, Le cinéma est mort. Film is dead. Film is dead. And, and people just booed him, and they, and they hated the film, too. A lot of people really hated the film. But it is a really, really good film, uh, in my opinion. I just think people had a hard time sort of wrestling with it. Uh, Gerard Depardieu and Sandrine Bonner uh, is an incredible tandem. Uh, Depardieu, of course, plays a, uh, a priest, and uh, I won't tell you exactly what the what the relationship in the film is. It's just you just know that you will be sitting there and you will be seeing two amazing actors under the direction of an incredible director give a tour de France, a tour de tour de France, tour de because uh, the tour de France, is yeah, because you know, tour de yeah. force performance. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one is Van Gogh, uh, starring Jacques Dutronc. Uh, it's a question of whether there are really only three films about Van Gogh that are sort of any good. There's the original Lust for Life with, uh, with Kirk Douglas, Kirk Douglas. Uh, as, as Van Gogh. Yeah. And then there is uh, Vincent Teo, the Altman film. And then there is uh, PLA's Van Gogh with Jacques Dutronc. And those are the only Van Gogh films really worth checking out. Uh, I, I just think this is a beautiful, beautiful film. It is, um, it's not entirely faithful to the historical events. If you're looking for that gory moment where Van Gogh slices his ear off, it's not in here. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't happen anywhere in this movie. But um, it, is a, it is a wonderful, beautiful, very sensitive biopic and uh, really very incredibly well done. 160 minutes, by the way. It's a long one. But it is, uh, it's just beautiful in every, every respect. Uh, I'm going I'm to leave Best Intentions for you, the Billy August film. Yeah. Uh, but I did want to I did want to talk about my golden days because I had a chance to write about it um, a little bit earlier this, on our Death Plushens film, uh, yeah. which is a a kind of a prequel to my Sex Life, a 1992 film that he did about Paul Daedalus, same nice. character Paul Daedalus, uh, be, being played by the same uh, same actors, and it's really a neat a neat little film. You don't have to have seen my Sex Life to enjoy this film. But if you have seen My, my mm. Sex Life, you'll enjoy this film all the more. He tells a number of stories in this film that actually go back to before the events uh. of the things that happened in My Sex Life, when he's an even younger uh, man than he is in, in that movie, which makes, which, which makes a lot of things that happen in My Sex Life make that much worse. It's basically the story of Paul Dedalus and his involvement with, with his first girlfriend, who he's with for a number of years um, in, in that movie, and he breaks up with her in that movie. When you watch this movie, you get to understand why he breaks up with her so coolly in that movie, mm -hmm. which is a movie that was actually shot and takes place 25 years before this movie. Uh, it's, it's a really sort of neat thing uh, to sort of watch them all together there. So check that out if you get a chance. Feature um, a special features, conversation with the director, uh, the casting session, um, uh, a couple of wonderful young actors in this movie playing the characters that appeared in the first movie from 1992. Excellent, excellent stuff here. So check this one out if you get a chance. Arnaud Desplechin, good, Arnaud Desplechin. Great, great Arnaud guy. Desplechin. Okay, and before we get to the best intentions, a uh, quick mention of a Strand release on DVD only, not Blu-ray, Sworn Virgin. Uh, great performances by Laura Bispori and Alba Rohrwacher. I, I thought um, it was pretty good, too, yeah. It, this is that, a, this that's is, a good history. It's a fascinating film. Um, uh, it's an Italian film, but it's got a whole Albanian angle to it. And the, the idea here it is, if you didn't know this, there is a weird tradition in Albania where women can actually legally become men. This mm -hmm. is not like a transgender thing. This is a cultural tradition 
where you simply de- sort of declare yourself. You make a declaration you make publicly. A, a public declaration that you're going to live as a man and you have to take an oath of celibacy. You will now never marry, never have sex. It's a complete oath of virginity. And there are women who basically walk around. They are And they do it for, for, for a good reason, particularly in the mountain country. They are pressured when they are very young uh, to, you know, marry. Yeah. And their and their and their parents, fathers mostly, will kind of you know negotiate their marriage. It's one of those sort of old school things. And to avoid that, that's what happens in this movie. Yeah. To avoid that pressure, uh, this young woman you know, takes the sworn oath, and yeah. and then many years later uh, decides you she know wants what? to she yeah. she wants to be a woman again. Yeah, and, and goes to the city and goes to the city, and it's how she sort of you know is able to restart her life and reinvent her her identity. It's really a fascinating movie. And done in a very, very, uh, you know, a very kind of cinema, very taste very, style, very, very right? Taste, very yeah. kind of like Romanian cinema. So uh, it's worth checking out. It really is Sworn Virgin, a very interesting film. That was at the uh, Berlin Film Festival uh, just last year. And uh, really, uh, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's really a, it's a sharp film. Um, this is my pick of the week. I, I just want to thank the people at Film Movement for finally filling in the longest vacant blank on my must-have list. Uh, <laughs> honestly, the best. No, the first year that I went to the Cannes Film Festival, you and I were writing. This is 1992. 92. We were writing. We were writing yeah. for Entertainment Today, and you remember how I did that. And Entertainment Today did not pay us yeah. anything. Tim was freelancing because he turned down the job that I eventually accepted, <laughs> and and uh, boy did I regret that. So I was working in the office, and uh, you know the suggestion. Oh, can you can you you know pay for me to go to Cannes? Boy, what boisterous <laughs> laughter that was met with. So I was able to finagle my way over to the Cannes Film Festival, and uh, this was my first year there, and um, it was one of the first films I saw. While I was there, I, made, I became very close friends with some Swedish journalists that I'm still friends with today, and uh, so there was, you know, there was a Swedish mood going on, and Billy August, who was Danish, had directed The Best Intentions, which was in competition, and The Best Intentions was a three-hour-long uh, look at the the romance of Ingmar Bergman's parents, scripted by Ingmar Bergman, but directed by Billy August. Mostly set in the early 1900s. He, pretty much, yeah. Uh, turn of the century, about 1909 ish. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember sitting there with you know my Swedish friends, and I just I cried my eyes out. It is the most gut wrench. I mean, you realize why Bergman became such a great dramatist because. He was he was born into a romance that was just dramatic in every, mm-hmm. every in all of its extremities. Um, an extraordinary film, one of the most extraordinary films I've ever seen. It is three hours that just blows by uh, rapidly. It is so beautifully done in every way. And you for, know what's interesting about the other film? It's so three hour film, uh, a film about Ingmar Bergman, yes. Bergman's family, written by Ingmar. Yet it is in no way, shape, or form. A Bergman film, not it's at Billy, all. It's a Billy August film, very much so, uh, very true. Which, in people who know Bergman films, will understand yeah. what I mean by that. There's a certain sort of yes. Little, but so this is not a Bergman film. No, it's a Billy August film about the. And so it's very fascinating in that way. And uh, Pernilla August, who who won Best Actor for it, uh, actress for it, of course, the uh, the director's wife. But mm-hmm. they were not husband and wife. They met on this film. So, uh, you know, and she's just, she's magnificent as well. So uh, I cannot recommend this enough. It is, it is a, a wondrous, wondrous film. It, the Blu-ray is, is just beyond compare. Uh, film, this film has never been on DVD, never been on Blu-ray, never been on VHS. In 24 years, this thing has never been out in any form whatsoever, not in streaming, not nothing. No one has been able to see this film in 24 years. Wow. So I recommend that you get this Blu-ray. Please get this and savor it. It is uh, You will not regret it. It is wonderful. Uh, it also includes the uh, 1984 short film Karen's Face by Ingmar Bergman, which also has never, ever been available in North America, and a Peter Cowie uh, uh, essay. So that's it's thin on extras, but what a movie. What an amazing movie. All right, and uh, that does it for the foreign stuff. So let's uh, let's get in now to our um, to our our uh, classic film segment, and this is where we are going to uh, treat you to a very interesting uh, interview that we recently conducted. We had um, a lot of comments on the uh, Facebook page. 
uh, about people loving the uh, the releases from Film Detective, the Blu-ray classic releases of films that normally would have uh, been out on uh, from really crappy DVD uh, public domain companies in the past. And suddenly, the, a lot of these movies uh, that have never really gotten proper releases are getting great Blu-ray releases from Film Detective. So, uh, with all of those comments on the uh, on the Facebook page. I the, people were asking more about Film Detective, and I thought, all right, it's time that we reach out to the Film Detective and uh, see what uh, you know what what makes that company tick. So we reached out to them, and Phil Hopkins, who runs Film Detective, along with his colleague Don Stradley, agreed to uh, talk to us. And Phil Hopkins has has been with a number of companies previously, so I've I've worked with Phil for for years, and. Uh, you know, he's one of those guys that just loves movies and knows a lot about movies and takes a great deal of care in, with movies. And uh, he, you know, he uh, he and Don Stradley are doing a wonderful, wonderful job over there and uh, creating a, a new company that is uh, filling in a lot of blanks and a lot of gaps in people's collections. So, without further ado, here are my uh, con- here's my conversation with Phil Hopkins and Don Stradley of the Film Detective. All right. It is uh, it is a wonderful hot day in July, and I'm avoiding the heat by uh, sitting inside and talking to uh, Phil Hopkins and Don Stradley from the Film Detective. Thanks for talking to us, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, we uh, we have been recovering your stuff for quite some time, and uh, we had a posting on our uh, on our Facebook page from one of our listeners who thanked us for mentioning your titles. Had purchased two titles and uh, was elated and was going to go dig through your library and wanted to know more about the about the company in general. And Phil, you've been through a number of different companies. Uh, we've worked with you for years in, in various incarnations. Could could both of you? Talk a little bit about um, what the film, de- what the philosophy, the grounding philosophy for the for the film detective is, and uh, and how the company came into existence. Well, we're, relate- we're elated that your uh, colleague and friend uh, was elated uh, to discover us. That's uh, wonderful news and uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, the challenge, obviously, in this uh, market right now is uh, with digital emerging and physical uh, product being uh, challenged to get into retail and, and, and have something that's uh, sold, uh, you really have to kind of uh, have something that's an improvement uh, on what one can purchase uh, out there in the world of home video. So our philosophy has been since we started uh, two and a half years ago is with uh, the home video and the DVDs and Blu-rays that we're releasing uh, to try to do things that haven't been done yet. Uh, and that includes uh, releasing the movies and their uh, correct aspect ratio, which is something uh, that was overlooked by uh, a number of uh, players in the industry for for many years. Uh, That's uh, something that we're spending a lot of uh, time to get right and consulting with uh, people like Bob Fermanac, who are authorities in uh, projection of proper aspect ratios, and trying to source good material, which has always been a challenge uh, when it comes to releasing public domain movies. Uh, those uh, sort of are the things that we're paying extra close attention to, um, and then certainly having great editorial uh, with the likes of Don Stradley. <laughs> well, Don, you, any, any thoughts? Yeah. Well, uh, one thing I was going to add, and Phil can uh, correct me if I'm off base, but I think there are still people out there who get very excited about DVDs and Blu-rays, even even though streaming is uh, likely the wave of the future. Uh, like you said, there was someone you knew who was very happy about what we were doing, and I I think that's uh, you know maybe it's the last wave or the second to last wave, but people are still interested in having a, a disc that they can hold in their hand and, and compare it to other discs. Uh, I think that's where we fit in, too. Well, it is, it is definitely, you know, our listeners are very much into the joy and the satisfaction of ownership, having that thing in your hand and, and knowing that there's not a, a giant uh, digital pipeline that separates you from the movie that you want to watch. And if your Internet goes down, then, you know, you, exactly. you, you're out of luck. Um, the, the titles that you guys have released, the one that really kind of lit, uh, lit us up and lit a lot of people up was Kansas City Confidential, which is, is just such a great classic. Uh, wh- how did that sort of fall on your radar? Well, it's um, certainly one of my favorite noir titles, and we got the 
um, treat to actually see it uh, on the big screen last month. Don uh, was uh, on hand for the uh, exhibition at a local theater where we live here north of Boston in Beverly, Massachusetts. We had a, a theatrical screening off of the high def uh, file, which just looked com incredibly stunning on a big screen in an old theater. Um, so that was a real treat, was to see something theatrically. And, and, and the investment to get to that resolution and spend as much time and money to get it restored, you you forget because so many people are kind of in the box, if you will, or they're watching things sort of on a, a tablet or a computer. To see something blown up in full resolution and to see the, the film like that was uh, really a big treat. So we're uh, we're doing it again this Wednesday with the Red House, and and noir titles tend to you know we have a soft spot for them. Uh, Don has written uh, for uh, Cinema Retro and uh, other publications over the years, so uh, those tend to get a lot of uh, excitement. Uh, Kansas City Confidential had again been previously released, and we felt that one of the biggest criticisms. Uh, in the market was uh, the fact that it, it, it had so much noise reduction, which is something that gets used to hide grain, and, uh, and broadcasters uh, tended to use it over the years. That was something that would remove artifacts, uh, and we learned uh, over the past few years that consumers want to see it as it would be projected off of film, meaning as much grain as possible. So we spent extra care uh, when we were doing the restoration on that to remove scratches and debris and various uh, audio pups and whatnot, but to leave all of the grain, to not touch it, to not artificially remove any of that stuff because we realized that the, the, the true fan of Blu-ray, uh, they're looking to get as much information off of that film as possible. And when you have Blu-ray, you can get full resolution off of the 35 millimeter. So that's exactly what we did, and we, we've been thrilled with the response, and we're trying to replicate that with our next few releases. And, you know, I want to talk for a second about uh, a couple of other films that I have a great fondness for, The Terror being the first one, which uh, you just recently released, and which I have a little bit of connection to because there was a documentary about 15 years ago that I co-produced called The Schlock, The Secret History of American Movies, where we talk about the terror, and sat, we sat down with Dick Miller, who gave us a lot of great behind-the-scenes stories about it. And in the process of putting that doc together, we were trolling through a lot of source material, trying to get some good-looking pieces of the terror. And I think, you know, we, we finally found some pieces that we were happy with, but I still don't feel like I really saw the film until your Blu-ray came out. And suddenly, I felt like I saw it for the first time. Uh, Thank you. Really, That's uh, really, wonderful in, to hear. Uh, really, in, just incredible. It just, it just brought it to life. I imagine the way that it actually looked, you know, when it was first released. Talk for a second about the challenges, because I, I mean, I know what we went through. Could you talk about what you go through and how you, how you deal? You, you said a little bit about, you know, cleaning up and restoration, but finding those source materials for public domain titles is is such a it's such a needle in a haystack effort and sometimes a lot of companies just don't see the uh, the, the value in it you guys do such an incredible job do you have a, a magical formula for what you do i wish we did um we would um be able to share the magic with uh, everyone in the way of uh, having pay increases for uh, <laughs> uh underpaid staff uh, <laughs> including uh, myself we, we we tend to work with collectors and we tend to work with folks like the Library of Congress and UCLA and other institutions that house film. Um, we have a film archive uh, ourselves that we sort of try to take care of and make sure that whatever material we keep in storage is worth keeping in storage and trying to not pay storage fees for something that's going to be never used. Um, there's all sorts of collectors out there that are, that are very um, paranoid for good reason when it comes to public domain movies. In the day of um, ripping, if one has a digital file of a film and if it's PD, uh, that's a sure way of having you know, prized possession uh, get out there in a bit torrent for the whole world to see. Right. It's a tricky place um, to navigate, and certainly studios and uh, home video companies tend to have less interest 
when releasing uh, public domain movies. Um, we happen to like the challenge. We, I, I have always felt that uh, the public domain uh, is an underserved, underappreciated area that doesn't fully get understood to um, the advantages of having those resources available when you can find good material. Um, but at the same time, I, I always say if we could get access to a studio negative or a studio print of a PD film, that's a much better scenario if you could do that. Um, that would require, though, the studios opening up their vaults to us and having the funds to cover the amount of money they'd be probably looking to receive to justify that. And right. when you look at the return on that, it doesn't. the economics don't always – add up. At some point, I'd like to think that Film Detective could go through all the studio vaults and have um, a lot of material uh, that we could be involved with that they would see less value in, because that usually is what happens with public domain. If you look at the sort of history of how public domain ends up into home video, uh, it's often the case, in, like it's a wonderful life. There were many years where that film was sold by 10 home video companies until Aaron Spelling uh, was able to come up with a way to uh, perfect a copyright on something that even is debatable today. Uh, but what it means is that there's a one source of good material and you're not getting subpar versions of it. That works for consumers and for us as film fans. Um, but if a film's not coming out, in the case of The Terror, um, that hadn't been released um, in we have access to material and we make a judgment call and say at some point, do we release it? Is it going to get released properly? We're not trying to um, discourage the studios, but at the same time, we like the, the films, we like the material, and if we have uh, an audience who appreciates it, then uh, we're thrilled and we can continue to do what we do. Let's talk for a second about uh, Dementia 13, which I just ha had a look at. And uh, after after slugging through about a decade's worth of uh, at least 20 or 30 really terrible releases of that, I think I had five on my shelf on DVD at one point, and, and none of them were. They were just all kind of an eyesore. This thing is, once again, it's a revelation. I mean, you really, really did a number on it. What did you... Where did you get the source materials, and what did what exactly did you do to sort of restore that early Francis Coppola um, artifact to uh, to its original glory? Well, unfortunately, we didn't get access to the negative. Um, we did get a, a, an email the other day from um, American Soap Tropes archivist asking us if, in fact, we had located the missing negative, which yeah. is still missing as as far as we know. Um, we were fortunate to have a release print, um, which is the majority of what we've used to date to release our titles. Um, and this was something, again, that had um, it, it had fairly decent uh, resolution, and we were able to get a, a good scan from it. It's, um, in my opinion, it's the best I've ever seen it, and I think that if it ever gets discovered to find the negative in an archive or a vault, then that will be fantastic. But from my perspective, the three months that we worked on restoring it, both sound as well as uh, picture quality, um, we're, we're very happy with how that came out. So thank you, and, and I, I appreciate uh, both the kind words you uh, have told me about the terror and Dementia 13, two films that are um, like from my childhood and certainly I'm sure – Don's and yours, you know, these were on late night TV uh, and bargain bin videos, and we knew of them because of the public domain. Um, and, and and you look at the history of being able to get any copy of a movie, whether it's on VHS or DVD. I remember getting uh, catalogs from um, like um, something uh, weird and sinister cinema and um, Chiller and all the, the folks who were still. Oh, yeah around in business yep. and it's it's because of companies like that and that we have an appreciation for catalog uh movies that probably wouldn't see studio releases and and, and those companies um i think are really the uh, champions of the cult movies and the esoteric movies and the b poverty row pictures uh that 
we're celebrating those titles. And um, now with technology and hopefully with um, some more luck in finding good prints, we'll uh, continue to carry on that tradition of releasing films in a, in a resolution that's going to have uh, that audience want to repurchase them again. And you know, I know I happen to have two or three versions of uh, different movies in my collection every time I see a, a better version. A good example of that is uh, White Zombie. I probably have four copies of White exactly. Zombie in my library. Yeah, yeah. well, it, no, it's true. I mean, and, and I went through that, like I said, with Dementia 13 and The Terror as well. You you just keep picking up every next release of it on DVD, hoping that one of them will really be the one. And uh, I think what you guys are doing is you're finally giving film collectors a chance to say, I've got the one, and that's it, and I don't need to, I don't need to look for this anymore. Um, what other titles can uh, in the in the coming months can we tease our our listeners with? What what else do you have in, in the pipeline that we can uh, announce? Well, uh, I believe next month uh, we're going to be putting out Patterns, which is the old Rod Serling uh, classic yeah. from the fifties, which was a TV drama, then it was a big screen drama. And it's been through the uh, public domain grind for a number of years. Um, and I think uh, this is going to be another great addition to, uh, to add along to the terror and dementia 13 as a, as a, another public domain movie that finally looks good and sounds good because the sound was is a problem with a lot of those movies too. Yeah, yeah, we we forget that that uh, the the audio sometimes is is in even worse condition than the picture, isn't it? Oh yeah, and what we're hoping, what I'm hoping, is, is um, all the people who bought all of those huge collections of a hundred DVDs for ten bucks in a, you know, in a box at your local drugstore, which was sort of a, a craze for a while. Um, uh, hopefully, they all got tired of those really horrible sounding discs, and uh, will come out and look for movies like Patterns and Dementia 13. Well, it's it's a, it's great great work you guys are doing. It really is. Um, what uh, what does the future look? And I'll and I'll I'll wrap it up with this. I mean, you talked a little bit about you know the, the obviously the the way that things are drifting now towards streaming, but there clearly continues to be uh, a demand for for physical product. Do you see that this is going to bifurcate? That a certain kind of movie is going to be a streamable movie, and another kind will be. Uh, a collectible movie, or is that line going to be kind of blurred? And is it what's going to happen? Do you do you have a crystal ball? I wish I did. Um, if I would certainly include you uh, in the lotto oh. drawing, if we had that. The, the 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 information that we're being told, obviously, is the digital revolution has happened. Um, if if that was the case, um, I think there'd be no home video um, sales at all. And so, fortunately, there's there's still the hardcore collectors and cinephiles that appreciate uh, what it takes to get a, a, a Blu-ray or a DVD into the marketplace. Uh, I think what we're going to have to do is kind of raise the bar a bit over the next few months and start to look to produce supplemental information. The, the one um, area that we, we know we're lacking in is uh, our ability to produce supplemental features, and that's something we're going to start working on um, later uh, over the next three to six months. And uh, having enough time in advance to produce supplemental features, and then as we grow the library, we're going to be launching a streaming platform of our movies as well as our editorial. Uh, we have a local movie um, host here in Boston named Dana Hersey, who's uh, signed on to be our voice of the film detective uh, streaming channel. So um, we will have a streaming service, which will be on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV will be on the web. And it will essentially be our library and possibly some other collectors' libraries that we um, distribute. And that will be uh, an area that we hope will gain some tracking as we continue to try to release more titles and finance the restoration. Well, you guys keep doing the, the, the great work that you're doing. It is definitely appreciated. We appreciate it, and our, our listeners really appreciate it. And uh, you, are, uh, you are helping a lot, of, a lot of collectors fill a lot of holes and plug a lot of blanks in their collections. So it is, uh, it is, really, it is really appreciated. So thank you again for talking to us, and uh, good luck going forward. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care. 
All right. There are the guys. So that's what makes uh, the film Detective Tick. And with that, we now move into what I was mentioning, Dementia 13, the, uh, the old Francis Coppola film that has just been uh, destroyed with so many horrible, horrible uh, public domain DVD releases that uh, a lot of people just don't even bother anymore. Uh, this is from 1963. Can you believe Francis Coppola yeah. directed a movie in 1963? It's like we, you know, this is a, a almost a decade before The Godfather. This is when he was, our, you know, sowing his seeds. And, yeah, Roger Corman and all that business. Oh yeah. my gosh, I was yeah. two, so you know. Well, anyway, uh, you know, it is uh, it, it is a fascinating look at uh, Coppola evolving as a filmmaker, kind of putting it, putting all the pieces together. And, um, you know, it continues to be a weird, creepy, and really cool cult film, black and white, 75 minutes long. Um, it's been out a million times, but uh, this is the first time it's really ever been out, I will say. The, the Francis Coppola-Roger Corman collaboration, Dementia 13, uh, a, a really extraordinary piece of film history that is finally out in a, in a Blu-ray release, courtesy of the film detective. And it's gorgeous, and it looks right, and uh, they have done right by a film that everybody else has done wrong by for so long. So, well done, guys. Keep up the good work, and uh, very, very happy to uh, to have this. So, keep collecting those uh, those film detective releases. They will keep coming out. All right, Tim. So, uh, other other classics here. Well, well, one that I truly love. Uh, we're sitting we're sitting in my in my spacious studio here in Pasadena, which I like to call Marengo House, where I only have two movie posters. They're right behind me. Yep. One is El Anzia, which is also known as The Hunger. That happens to be the Argentine uh, lobby poster for that, which is why it's called El uh -huh. Anzia. The other one is a poster uh, uh, for a Dalton Trumbo uh, the movie the about the documentary about Trumbo called yeah. Trumbo. That's the other one because it's Dalton Trumbo over there. I have in my hand The Brave One, which, of course, is uh, written by Dalton Trumbo. Um, an, an ex extraordinary Irving rapper film because it's about so much. It's it's a film ostensibly about a little boy trying to save his bull uh, yeah. from being from being you know slain by the, the the greatest matador in Mexico. That's ostensibly what the film is about, but it's but it's about so 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 much more. And it's a beautiful f film too. I remember this film that that color that that beautiful it's color a, it, that Technicolor <sighs> era when everything just popped. Oh, the reds and yeah. the blues, and it's just beautiful. A little melodramatic by today's standards, certainly. Uh, but I, I absolutely adore this film. Cinemascope, uh, what do we have here? Do we have any special features on this? Special features include an isolated score track, the score by Victor Young, uh, and, a French, and a French audio track. That's, oh, there you go. Yeah, French audio track. I love it. Yeah. I love it when that happens. <laughs> uh, anyway, The Brave One, Urban Rapper's film, fantastic. Daughter of Dawn is another great release from our good friends at uh, Milestone. You know, they, they do, Amy and Dennis over there at Milestone do such an amazing job. They... It's important to understand that what people in their position do, the people who do the work of archivists and, and uh, digging up these, these obscure little movies that are important that nobody else will bother with, it's a labor of love, and it is not easy, and it is not cheap, and uh, I just cannot applaud them enough. They're just amazing people, and, uh, and I love them to death. Um, this is an incredible movie. The Daughter of Dawn is significant for a lot of reasons. For starters, it was made in 1920, and it was the first and the only film for a long time that had an all-Native American cast. Mm. Not people dressed up as Native Americans, pretending to be Native Americans. Not, you know, Iron Chuck, Eyes... Chuck Heston. Yeah, not, not, not <laughs> Natalie Wood uh, pretending to be, a, you know, a Native American girl, and not, uh, not, not Iron Eyes Cody, who's actually Italian, pretend, yeah. you know, fooling us right into the 70s. None of that. No. This is... Uh, this was absolutely straight up a 100% Native American cast and it was shot by a first time director entirely on location in the mountains of Oklahoma uh, by a guy named Norbert Miles um, and uh, it, it, is, it is really an incredible kind of ethnographic artifact it is, it's, it's amazing and this was considered lost for almost a century uh, and uh, they found it uh, over at the Oklahoma Historical Society and uh, completely restored it, gave it a whole new uh, score track, and, uh, and what a wonderful, wonderful movie it is. You know, it, is, uh, it, it, just, it, it captures Native American life in a way that no film since would be able to, because in 1920, you're still close to 
that that moment when everything was lost, when uh, the Industrial Revolution and and reservations and just the growth of the United States and everything else sort of squeezed that last uh, the last remnants of of Native American indigenous society. And a lot of the people here certainly would remember it, or they would have parents who remembered it. They're connected to it in a way that you're not going to get with any any subsequent film. So uh, you know the, the the depiction of you know the, their lives, their daily lives, their loves, their ro- it's essentially kind of a romantic triangle in a way. The story it's not narratively anything that's amazing, but just in terms of what it depicts and and the people in it and the historical role that it plays. It's an amazing movie. So The Daughter of Dawn on Blu-ray from Milestone, absolutely wonderful, must have. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, 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 that sounds absolutely amazing. In 1955, Orson Welles made a British uh, documentary television series. Uh, there are only about six or seven episodes of yeah. it. It's called Around the World with Orson Welles. It's a fantastic, fantastic series. And I remember... Uh, at least growing up in St. Louis anyway uh, in the, I'm going to say late 60s early 70s, for whatever reason this series used to come on I remember it specifically it would come on right after uh, The Avengers another uh, British, uh, ABC British television series, The Avengers with John Steed Emma Pill, that whole kind of thing, I would watch that and then I would watch this, this was fantastic it was Orson Welles more or less taking us on a sort of like travel log of Europe uh, and we would wander around Europe. He would take us to great places, introduce us to uh, extraordinary people of the day, uh, uh, Greco, Cocteau. I mean, you know, I mean, these yeah. people do, who you say these names. In order, he just knew these people. That <laughs> was his scene. It was just his scene. He just, you know, like, go, go, go talk to John Cocteau. <laughs> hey, John. That's great. What are you doing? Man? That's and, great. And it, was, and it was very much like that. It was, uh, he, he wrote every um, episode of this. But it was very much like he was just wandering around, running mm-hmm. into people. That's great. And I've uh, narrated fantastic, beautiful black and white photography. Uh, Orson Welles, Around the World with Orson Welles, a complete series. Um, all kinds of fantastic stuff on this, uh, including a little bit of behind the scenes stuff. And that, that's from B2MP, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Uh, we are, we're starting to review some stuff from B2MP, who does a lot of great stuff, and uh, we're happy to be doing that. And one of their other releases is A Slipper in the Rose, uh, the Cinderella movie with Richard Chamberlain. Uh, and with songs by the Sherman Brothers, Mary Poppins and everything else that Disney ever did. Um, and uh, th- th- this is rarely seen, actually. This is from uh, 1975. Kind of a, you know, a, a Brian Forbes, the great uh, British director, directed this. And uh, it kind of, you know, it faded for a moment. And it's so good to have it back on Blu-ray. It really, really is just absolutely wonderfully put together. The songs are great. Uh, Chamberlain's fantastic supporting performances well not even supporting but you know the, the rest of the cast uh, it's, it is after all a Cinderella story it's not about the prince uh, Jim McRaven Edith Evans uh, and Michael Hordern it's, it's really really good so especially in light of the recent Cinderella the Kenneth Branagh Cinderella the, the, the non sort of non-musical Disney Cinderella yeah. it's nice to have another live action one to refer to from a, a different era and it's just beautiful it's terrific uh, I have the pretty extraordinary Joseph Anthony uh, Robert Duvall film Tomorrow uh, based on the Faulkner short mm-hmm. story and the yeah. Gordon Foot play. Uh, so this would have been Joseph, Joseph Anthony directed The Rainmaker. <clears throat> and this would have been his last film, 1972. So this, this capped off his career. Uh, interesting. The Faulkner. Uh, it's, it's, nobody reads Faulkner anymore. I had a, <laughs> a hell of a uh, uh, English literature teacher when I was in high school. He made us read all this stuff. In The Faulkner... Um, this is the story of a farmer uh, who takes in this pregnant woman, uh, and, and he takes care of the pregnant woman, and the, and, and, and the woman dies and has, has the baby and dies, and he takes care of the baby, and, and all kinds of things happen. This is a very, a very profound and dark, fairly tragic. Uh, most of it is told from the point of view of the trial, and. The interesting thing about the Faulkner is that the woman that the Robert Duvall character takes in was black, hmm. in, in the Faulkner. Yeah. Uh, Foot makes her white, and she's white in this in this movie, but in the Faulkner she was black. Isn't that it, interesting? It, it added an entirely different level uh, to the story. It's still huh. a very powerful thing. Look, Robert Duvall at any point in his career. This is 1972. Mm-hmm. Robert Duvall can't go wrong with Robert Duvall. No. Gorgeous, uh, a gorgeous, and important film. Kind of in the mode of that sort of uh, of mice and men. Uh, sort of uh, John Ford sort of stelli- uh, storytelling style, even though it was made in 1972. Uh, Abel Ferrara, guy who never Abel. fails, never fails to just disappoint and shock. His films are always so interesting. This is a uh, this is the most unusual movie he may he probably ever made. Uh, this is 
uh, Napoli, 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 uh, otherwise known as Naples, Naples, Naples. And uh, Abel Ferrara, a guy who, you know, really wrestles with his Italian heritage and his, his Catholic uh, heritage. And, you know, all these things are sort of big, they're, they're thorns in all of his movies. And he trips over them and he wants you to trip over them. And this is fascinating. It is allegedly based in fact, although I, it's hard to sort of figure out quite how and to what degree. Um, but it is a, this is basically a docudrama about a woman um, who sort of is your mythical vehicle through all of the, 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 the stuff that's going on in Naples, Italy. And um, it, is, uh, it is a troubling, beautiful, poetic in strange and kind of hypnotic uh, film in many respects. And, uh, you know, Naples is a movie that has a certain historical significance, not just anciently, but as recently as World War II. Yeah. And uh, really sort of at this, the epicenter of a lot of significant international uh, geopolitical stuff within the last century. In any case, uh, this is really, really a, kind of a, a fascinating movie. And uh, I'd love to know sort of what, what realistic part of it uh, this was inspired here. But in any case... You get an illustrated booklet, and um, that's essentially it. There's not much else by way of extras, but this is from Raro Video, the uh, the the, the uh, a certain line of uh, that is distributed by Kino, and it's on Blu-ray. Uh, I've got uh, the collector's edition, The Return of the Living Dead. Yes, uh, one of three films that Dan O'Bannon directed, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. 1985 film. Uh, Dan O'Bannon, of course, associated. We associate Dan with uh, Alien. Alien, uh, for sure. I mean, yeah. Forever, Dan a lot, a lot of genre films uh, from the 80s. Yeah, basically. yeah. Then he wrote a whole bunch of them. Only directed three. Uh, the Return of the Living Dead is, was one of the ones he directed. So he took that sort of George A. Ramiro uh, Night of the Living Dead, sort of very serious, obviously black and white. Uh, some people say uh, socially relevant. Uh, social commentary films so people say it's not a social commentary film uh, that he and Ruscio and all those guys did and he and he made this film which is really really a very silly film this is a spoof of many of the things that were uh, going on and, and he actually gives reason for the zombies uh, the, the goofy kids do something they release a gas into the air and the gas is yeah. what reanimates all the dead people and stuff like that so he, he took it in an entirely different direction uh, for this 1985 film but I gotta tell you this stuff is still a lot of fun and zombies still plaguing us to this day Yeah. to this very day the zombies are freaking everywhere uh, this, was a, this is a slow zombie movie by the way you know you got fast zombies or slow zombies they were still working with slow zombies, which I prefer because they're creepier to me. In yeah, ways. yeah. Who needs? I don't need a fast ass zombie running at me. That's disgusting. So I'm gonna go. <laughs> gonna go quickly through a few things here. Uh, I got some. Got a couple of double features. One from Shout Factory. The first one from Shout Factory is Gray Eagle and Winter Hawk. Great American Frontier double feature. Uh, neither of these are particularly great, but they they have kind of a, a kitsch factor. A uh, you know these are these are programmers. And uh, you get them to kind of just throw on in the background and sort of, you know, enjoy. Ben Johnson is in Grey Eagle, and he's always... Ben Johnson's good, uh, you know, workman-like guy. The only thing, the reason to see Winterhawk is because Don Wells is in it, and yeah. pretty much anything Don Wells is in is great. Uh, Woody Strode and Denver Pyle also show up in this. So, you know, there's a lot of familiar Western faces, uh, although Don Wells is not really famous for Westerns. Uh, she's Marianne. Yeah, man, yeah. Oh, man. Don't then, even give me... Yeah, I, now I'm all dizzy <laughs> and everything. You mentioned Marianne, I go dizzy. And then Christopher Lee and Klaus Kinski made a couple of movies in 1966 and 67, borderline exploitation movies, uh, also kind of programmers. Uh, and those are thrown together on a blue underground double feature of Circus of Fear and Five Golden Dragons. Uh, the, uh, the Circus of Fear is the more interesting one here. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's nominally an exploitation film. It's not very fearful. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, a spooky horror film from, uh, from you know, the mid-60s. And it has a wonderful commentary by the director, uh, John Moxie, which is worth the price all by itself. It's, that, that alone is, is really quite entertaining and very interesting. I've always been a big, big, big fan of Jeremy Irons, particularly yep. young, young Jeremy Irons. It's fantastic. I have this film Moonlighting here. Not uh, to be confused with uh, the, the television Bruce series. Willis yeah. and then, yeah, yeah. And the Civil Shepherd and all that, which I love too, actually. But I this is a really neat film. This film's a uh, 1982 film. This film won uh, uh, Best Screenplay at Cannes in 1982. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, it, it's a really, really neat, neat film set during that period when uh, uh, Poland was just, just sort of going through all this Alek with Valencia and, and yeah. Solidarity and all of that was going on. This is about uh, these Polish uh, construction workers who go to London. 
Uh, you, they were importing workers into London to do all of the sort of work because you know the population of, of, of the UK has been dwindling. Oh yeah, you know, of, you know UK citizens have yeah. literally been dwindling for almost thirty-five years yeah. now. It's really, really just this all works back to that Brexit thing yeah, that's yeah, going on right now. Sure. This is all related material. Uh, I got something dinging around over here. Anyway, this movie sort of speaks to all of that stuff um, and, and how that Thatcher era business. Is still playing out today. Absolutely. That 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 talk, uh, Miss May, who who just got elected, you know, oh, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Thatcher too, basically what yeah. it is. Some of the sort of rhetoric of her and Thatcher play out in this film. So it's an interesting film. Uh, audio commentary with Jeremy Irons. Uh, the film is Moonlighting. Uh, the director is Jersey Sloma Whiskey. Jersey nice. Sloma Whiskey. Yes. Yeah. And then a couple from Flickr Alley, uh, from their Manufacture on Demand, uh, Blu-ray Burn line, I guess BDR is what we would be calling these. Uh, five experimental, uh, five American experimental films of the 1950s. And then uh, The Ghost That Never Returns by Abram Room. Um, the, these are from the Black Hawk Films Collection, uh, the, the films that are curated and, and preserved by David Shepard. The films are Abstract and Concrete from 1952, uh, from 1952 and 53, the Jim Davis films Analogies and Color Dances, uh, and then uh, Tre uh, Treadle and Bobbin by Wheaton Gallantine from 1954, and then lastly, uh, New York, New York, or NYNY by Francis Thompson, which, was, which is sort of filmed all through the 40s and the 50s. And uh, which is really unbelievable, a shot with a very special camera, the Kodak Cine special camera, which uh, had all these mirrors and weird kaleidoscopic attachments and stuff. Really interesting bunch of films. And then uh, The Ghost That Never Returns is a 1930 film that uh, is, it sort of represents this, this very, you know, it comes on the tail end of that classic Soviet cinema period of Eisenstein yeah. and Zygovertov and all of that. But it, um, it, it, is, it is very, very different from all of that. This is uh, the same director, by the way, uh, Abram Room, who did Bed and Sofa, mm. and, which is also available from Flickr Alley. And uh, it, is, uh, it is really a, a, kind of a, a strange, early, talky experimental that um, you know, has all, it, it, very gritty and kind of realistic in a way that Soviet films of the era were not. Uh, so that's, that's definitely worth checking out. The Ghost That Never Returns. Mm. Mm. I've got a, I've got a one from the thirties too. Frank Capra film, Lady Lady for a Day. Oh, I love this. It's a lovely film, sort of light Frank, Frank Capra film. Yeah, yeah, Annie Apple, she's this yeah. indigent woman in New York, uh, and her daughter. She's been telling her daughter that she's a aristocratic yeah. high society sort of girl, and uh, her daughter's going to come. She has the Spanish ambassador and all of this, and this guy, this sort of dandy, who considers her so like a uh, a luck charm, sets her up in a nice apartment and. And basically makes her look like she's the high society person. It's, it, it plays out all of those sort of Frank Capra tropes about right. class and all that kind of stuff. Lovely film, a lot of fun. This one has special features, includes an essay from film historian Scott Eyman and a commentary track from Frank Capra Jr. Neat Beautiful. movie. Yeah. Nice. Lady for a day. Lady for a day. Three from uh, the Kino Lorber Studio Classics line. Um, all of them worth checking out, really. Um, the, uh, I thought we had covered this actually once before, but this may be out again. Where's Papa with George Siegel and Ruth Gordon? Uh, this is actually a lot of fun. Um, Ruth Gordon, when she stopped being a screenwriter and started being a, uh, an actress, uh, really just kind of, it, it's, a whole, it's a whole new ball of wax, as everybody knows who's ever yeah. seen you know, any of her performances, Rosemary's Baby and Harold and Maude. Anyway, uh, Carl Reiner directed this in 1970, one of his early directing efforts, and... Uh, you know, a lot of interesting performances show up in here. Uh, Paul Sorvino, Garrett Morris, Barnard Hughes, Ron Liebman. Uh, a lot of people who, you know, go on to have great careers on television. Uh, Cuba with Sean Connery and Brooke Adams. Uh, kind of a, you know, it, it's sort of in some respects a, a silly movie in hindsight. Uh, especially now, all the things that are going on with Cuba. But uh, you know what? It, it, it's perfectly fine. It takes place uh, around the 1959 uh, Cuban Revolution, and Sean Connery is, uh, you know, it, this is shot in 1979, by the way, so it's well after Bond for him, except for, you know, uh, Never Say Never Again. But uh, it's him trying to sort of do a Bondish thing as a mercenary. 
who's up to all kinds of antics in revolutionary Cuba. Uh, Brooke Adams is wonderful, uh, directed by Richard Lester, very uncharacteristic film for him with a uh, great score by Patrick Williams. And then uh, Five Miles to Midnight with Sophia Loren and Anthony Perkins, uh, which is uh, one of those really super cool Anthony Perkins creep fests yeah. from the 1960s, 1963, uh, produced and directed by Anatole Litvak. And uh, really an uncharacteristic film for um, Sophia Loren, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's perfect for Anthony, Anthony Perkins. It's not so much uh, for her. But uh, anyway, they play a... Um, it's a, you know, about a couple who have this, uh, this plan to sort of get rich very quickly. And naturally, of course, you know, things wind up going incredibly badly. Um, but uh, very, very, you know, it's, it's, still a, a, it's still a cool film from the era. It's got a great vibe. I have got the crush here. Uh, Alicia Silverstone 1993 this yeah. movie was I did the junket for oh this movie gosh. I say that all the time on this show dude I've been doing this shit too long yeah. <laughs> just too long 1993 I did the crush for this Carrie Elway Alicia Silverstone she's this 14 year old girl uh, she gets this crush on Carrie Elway okay, he's a journalist or whatever the heck he is in the movie and it's like one of these this is just all wrong kind of things the thing of it is he doesn't really do anything uh, he in fact uh, rebukes uh, her romantic uh, uh, advances, uh, and then she, and then she, uh, man, she crushes him. Indeed, I thought the double entendre of that title was always pretty good. Uh, Alicia Silverstone. Guess what year she was born in? Oh gosh, uh, 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 80, 80. Mm, 1976, baby. She's oh. forty. Oh wow! Now all the things I used to think about her twenty-five years ago are perfectly okay. <laughs> the crush. Oh, that's great. Um, three from the uh, Warner Archive collection where, as we're rounding down here uh, a couple of them on just regular DVD-Rs and then one of them on Blu-ray which is just to die for uh, the ones on uh, DVD-R the regular uh, manufacture on demand titles one is Jack of Diamonds with George Hamilton. George Hamilton when he was a, when yeah, he was a movie star. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, it's, uh, George Hamilton, Joseph Cotton, uh, Marie Laforet, and Maurice Evans. Uh, Jack of Diamonds is basically, I guess, the, the you know, it's somewhere in the, it's, it's the George Hamilton version of It Takes a Thief crossed with the Thomas Crown Affair. That's a really, really good movie. One of the one of the one of the things in that movie is this because he the reason why he gets hired is because he's gorgeous. Yeah, and and, uh, and they need a pretty, pretty, pretty man to pull off this thing. Yeah. You know, so that's the point of his thing. And the thing. And I remember a scene in that movie where he does something wrong, and one of the bad guys has got to got to rough him up, up a bit. Yeah, and the guy says, "Don't hit him in the face." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, man, I don't think I've I've seen I had seen a movie to that point yeah. before. That was so pointed about the necessity of the guy being pretty. It's a lot of fun. I yeah. mean, any of these, any of these kind of sophisticated criminal, yeah. uh, cat burglar slash thief movies are just a lot of fun from this era, and there and there were a lot of them. Um, but the supporting cast here is just fantastic. Not only Joseph Cotton, but I mean, you know, Zsa Zsa Gabor shows up in this yeah. thing. Um, Carol Baker shows up. It's just, it's a lot of fun. It's a really, it's a, it's a great classy movie. And then uh, Count the Hours with Teresa Wright, who can do no wrong by me. I, I was just done. And McDonald Carey, who's always fun. But, you know, Teresa Wright could just show up in a movie and just sit there for two hours, and I'd be perfectly fine. So beautiful. Uh, oh, she's just amazing. Even, you know, even when you get to, like, uh, Somewhere in Time, oh, yeah. where she's an old woman. Yeah. She captures that movie. She's just magnificent. Anyway, this was directed by none other than Don Siegel. The Don uh -huh. Siegel who would go on to do so many great Clint Eastwood westerns and actioners like Dirty Harry. The and Don others. Siegel who taught Clint Eastwood how to direct. I mean, Sergio Leone, yes, yes, but Don Siegel taught Clint Eastwood how to direct. Yes. Make no mistake about it. Well, this is, uh, this is kind of a pseudo-noir. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a murder... And, uh, you know, I, I, and then it gets a little procedural. I won't give you any of the twists and turns. It's kind of hard to sort of talk about who does what and, and can't do what because of what. But uh, as far as, you know, sort of uh, noirish procedural courtroom drama crime films, uh, this is actually one of the better ones that, uh, that came out of that particular uh, Hollywood era. So, uh, I, I, you know, it's really, really fun. Un, uh, uncounted thrills, it says on the poster. Count the hours. <laughs> <laughs> Uncounted thrills, count the hours. And then on Blu-ray from the Warner Archive collection, this is the gem this week, the unsinkable Molly Brown starring Debbie Reynolds. Uh, yeah. um, this is their Blu-ray, one of those occasional Blu-rays we get out of the Warner Archive collection, but they're coming more and more. And Molly Brown, of course, uh, as everyone knows, was you know on the Titanic, right? Didn't so sink. She didn't sink. She didn't sink. Yeah. So uh, she played by Kathy Bates yeah, in uh, yeah. James Cameron's film. 
not so here. Much, much more engaging uh, casting here with Debbie Reynolds. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is what Meredith Wilson did after The Music Man. And it's a delight. And it is so colorful and it's so beautiful and it looks so good on Blu-ray. And Debbie Reynolds is so great. And they have a behind-the-scenes documentary here, uh, which is just absolutely wonderful as well. So, uh, you know, directed by the great Charles Walters, who is second only to Vincent Minnelli, as far mm-hmm. as I'm concerned, as directors of, of great musicals. Um, Charles Walters also did, you know, Lily. Fantastic director. Wonderful movie. Ah, I've got roller coaster here. I'm, I'm looking at this box. I got stuck in the box for a second. 1977, right? I remember this movie because I actually went to see this movie in 1977 when it, when it came out, <laughs> and it was actually pretty damn good. It's a movie about a guy who's blackmailing uh, all, all of these cities, uh, threatening to uh, uh, sabotage these roller coasters all over the country, and he does. He sabotages a few. It was a very, very good movie, directed by James uh, Goldstone. Is it Goldstone? Yes, Goldstone. James, James Goldstone. Neat movie. Uh, you know, check it out if you get a chance. Uh, nothing particular on this. You got an interview with the writer Tommy Cook. Perfect. All right, that is it, guys. We are done this week. Mark will be back next week. And uh, if you have anything you want to send us, Vox boxes, questions, you name it, send them to gods at digigods.com. We'll see you then. Mm-hmm.